It's time for a new evolution in raising golfers, one that doesn't involve headaches, tears, or heading down the path of unknown. Whether you're trying to introduce children to the game of golf, help them play competitively, or play at a collegiate level, you're in the right place. This show is for any parent, player, or coach who wants to build a better team at home and on the golf course. This is the Raising Golfers Podcast. U.S.A. U.S.A. Woo! I'll tell you what, what an exciting finish to the Ryder Cup yesterday. Holy smokes, the United States team took down Europe with a record final score of 19 to 9. I had the pleasure of watching the entire thing and it was just a true pleasure. I just enjoyed every single minute of it. I can't wait to have the next one and can't wait to see how the teams match up again. But that was something I felt was kind of long overdue and just really, really excited for golf in the United States and for anybody, especially junior golfers all over the world, whether you're in the United States, in Europe, or any other part of the world, I think this type of format, whether it's the Ryder Cup or President's Cup, is something that children should always strive to look forward to, maybe trying to play one day. And I think I should give a shout out to the PJ Junior League because they offer something very similar, which is a really cool way to get junior golfers involved in the game of golf. In this episode, we're going to talk about fitness and physical therapy and why it's so important to incorporate this into your junior golfer's routine. Today joining me on the podcast is George Tate from Golf Movement Systems. George has been playing golf his entire life all the way through Division I college golf and now has a doctorate in physical therapy. He focuses solely on fitness and physical therapy for golfers and will be sharing all kinds of great information for all of us today. All right, George, I really appreciate you taking the time out, and welcome to the Raising Golfers podcast. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm excited because there's going to be a lot for me to learn today, you know, in this space in relation to this part of golf, and junior golf is something that I actually need to learn more about, and you're the first person to come on the podcast that has experience in physical therapy and in fitness in relation to golf, so this is going to be really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. you got a lot of good stuff lined up here. Sweet. Yeah. So let, let's start with this, though, because I'm really curious, and I think for the listeners, too, you know, being in physical therapy and fitness, did it start in golf or did you do physical therapy and start in another sport or another area before you came to golf? How did it all begin? Um, so for me, born and raised golfing. So um, grew up in uh, Springfield, Illinois, so a town about 120,000. Um, they gave me golf clubs as soon as I could walk. So my um, grandpa and grandma and a lot of my college friends uh, who I grew up playing golf know this, but they owned a putt-putt place. And then they oh, wow. owned a driving range before that. So as soon as I could walk, I was putting. And from there on, you know, played junior golf, did the AJGA stuff. You know, grandpa and dad took me everywhere. Um, played high school golf, did well there. Um, ended up getting a scholarship to Southern Illinois Carbondale, which was D1, played golf for them. And then, wow. um, so, I mean, I played soccer growing up, you know, dabbled in basketball, t-ball. Once I didn't make the sixth grade team in basketball, I figured, you know, it was a sign. So uh, I'd say middle school is when I officially uh, focused mostly on golf um, and never looked back. So when it comes to kind of um, the carryover with the fitness aspect of it, uh, I got didn't get into that until late high school and college. Um, obviously, you go play golf someone or excuse me somewhere that has expectations as far as scholarship things like that. You know, um, different at- atmosphere, different level, a little bit more pressure on you. So, um, obviously, golf was an escape growing up, and it still wasn't college. But um, I turned to fitness. And working out is just a different escape. So, you know, when you have a bad round on the golf course and you go don't go to a tournament in college, what do you do? So, and at that point, I just went, went to the gym. So that's kind of how it carried over with um, getting involved in fitness. And then in college, I was initially a exercise, or excuse me, a business major, changed to exercise science, um, got my bachelor's degree in that, and then... Um, continued to be interested in, in fitness, and then went on after that to get my doctorate in physical therapy. So um, that's kind of how they intermingled over time. And then 
after my uh, after I got my doctorate, and then I was able to play more golf because I was done with school. So that's kind of where it all comes back together there. That's pretty cool. That's a great story. Well, and you you know you've got obviously some really really um, high education in this field in this area, and I'm sure your current students really appreciate the knowledge and experience you have not only just from your educational side, but then also how it ties into your background in the game of golf, you know, playing division one golf, which is really cool. So then, you know, for listeners and even for myself, really, what would be like the main difference between physical therapy and then fitness in relation to golf? So fitness performance, that's, you know, um, the fitness area for me is like being able to physically perform on your highest and best level. Um, Physical therapy, um, just physical therapy in general, even in or outside of golf, is just treating somebody who has um, deficits in movement, strength, um, they're just movement abilities, or they're having pain, they can't get in a certain position. So like for the everyday person, it's like back pain, neck pain, um, you know, you step in a pothole in the yard, twist your ankle. So that's kind of the the everyday gold standard of physical therapy, um, getting you back over those injuries back to your everyday life. So when you mix that with golf, um, there's two different, uh, two different ways or excuse me, two different experiences that I mostly see. It's, it's somebody who's, I want to perform on the highest level and I can't do that because of my back pain. It holds me back. I can only walk nine holes and then, you know, I have to take medication beforehand. I'm not playing good. So, or, they have a history of a knee injury and they can't make a, as big of a turn as they were prior because they can't get to that side. They can't load properly. So I look at it that way. And then um, also outside of somebody who has like a physical injury or something going on, just somebody who just wants to hit the ball farther. So there's nothing wrong with them physically. They feel good. They move good. They have good strength, but they want to hit the ball farther. And that's kind of when it, comes to the performance and fitness side of it um, that's what I look at so they they go back and forth because obviously you have to have a certain amount of strength and mobility to get out of pain or to move a proper way well the same thing happens if you want to hit the ball farther you have to have more strength and potentially more motion to do that so it's it's a good carryover for both directions so two questions for you then you know when, I, when you're saying this I'm thinking about you know junior golfers right and before where I'm at now, I was actually coaching golf in China and we actually had like a whole fitness uh, team that was doing a lot of, you know, fitness uh, for golf and for the juniors. And a lot of concern that parents had would be number one would be like, can they get injured playing golf physically? And will the, you know, will these fitness classes, you know, how will they benefit them you know, starting at such a young age. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that maybe start with the first one would be is like, you know, can junior golfers, can they, can they get injured? They seem like these flexible, you know, little people that can bend all kinds of directions and, and ways and, and seem very flexible. But, you know, then again, you know, I could be wrong. Yeah. I would, I would say it's less prone. I mean, the, the little kids I work with, they're injured because they're on the monkey bars and they fell or they climbed mm-hmm. a tree and they fell. Um, I haven't, dealt with somebody who's had, um, excuse, under the age of uh, probably 13 that has developed a physical injury from golf. Um, kids are resilient, but just like everybody else, if you're active and you're moving, in, anybody can be prone to injury. But I see that a little bit more older. I see more so in the um, 15 to 18 year old, some, some overuse. Um, issues there, particularly in uh, in young girls. So um, wrist is a lot of what I see there. But um, they they absolutely can get can get injured. But um, the fitness and this was your second question, if I do believe. How does the fitness kind of class kind of tie into that? Is that correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So with with that at a certain certain age, I do think it could help. It could help with the development of their physical abilities long term. So. When you look at like the the developments of people, um, you have these certain windows from like four to seven, eight to ten, eleven to fourteen, fifteen to eighteen, and there's um, a speed window where, based on that child's age and how they're developing at that particular age, it would be of most benefit to work on 
this. And for instance, for boys from the age of five to eight, that's their first speed window. So I have young clients that are within that window who they come to me, their parents come to me, it's like, what can we do? Well, at that age, we just want to work on moving as quickly as possible. So we're not deadlifting, we're not squatting, we're just keeping it fun at that age. And then I'm getting them to use both sides of their body and to move as quickly as possible. So um, I just made a program for a seven-year-old and it, it looks like, you know, throwing football with your opposite arm, badminton, running back and forth, like running football routes in the yards, keeping all those short explosive movements under five seconds. So um, at that age, I think the fitness classes can absolutely be a, of benefit. But the important thing, I think, is just to keep it fun um, for the kids and for yourself. It's a blast because at that age, they just do whatever. And it's it's really enjoyable just to make sure you keep it enjoyful for the child because you are, you know, seeking additional guidance in the physical aspect of somebody's playing golf, but here we are not even eight years old yet. So um, that's what I think the, I see the priority when it comes to fitness training at that young of an age. Well, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the big premise in this podcast is, you know, something Jim Hardy from U.S. Kids Golf said, he said, make it fun enough, long enough, so they can't get enough. And I think, you know, if yeah. you're going to be implementing the physical side and the fitness side of things into to classes for children. I think it has to be fun. It has to be enjoyable. And it's something that you want them to say, you know, Hey mom and dad, I can't wait to go back to my fitness class for golf on Tuesday. Right. And you know, the, the longer they're saying those things, you know, then of course they're going to improve. They're going to develop within the program. And mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're keeping it longer as opposed to them not wanting to go to that. And then they're just going to either a give up the fitness side. So they're not going to develop at the speeds that we want them to, or B, they might just give up the whole game itself, right? So yeah, I think it's really cool that you're doing that. So then for like maybe a little bit of advice then for – this would be both for parents uh, first and then it would be for coaches. If you're not already involved in some type of golf fitness training or, you know, seeing a fitness coach, you know, what advice would you give them and, and how do they search and look for somebody to find in the area? Um, you can look up TPI specialists that are certified in junior development. So there's the junior program lays out basically the life plan of this golf or what you should do at certain ages, how long, all the details, and it's, it's pretty good. But when I, you know, when a parent comes to me and talks about that, at an early age, I just think it's, again, going back to keeping it fun and to make sure they're involved in several sports. You know, any movement one way over a period of time, regardless of what age you are, can cause can cause problems. So, um, you know, I had another kid I did an eval on. He's seven, and I told Dad, like, I he's playing tennis. I, I want to keep him playing tennis. So he's slow with his left side. Um, he has a lot of potential to, to gain a little bit of pop in his swing. So I told him, you know what, let's make your, your backhand in tennis as strong as possible. So work on that. So, um, you know, encouraging parents, like, you know what, let's keep him in basketball this winter. Um, just basically making sure they're getting stimulation from a physical ability standpoint from all, all directions, I think, at that age. Does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think absolutely. And I, I think that's so important. And that kind of ties back to with, like, you know, I made this mistake when I first started coaching. And I thought it was better that, you know, children just focused on one sport. And then I quickly learned that was wrong, right? And then mm -hmm. just, you know, as far as from the coordination standpoint, like what you're saying there is like getting involved in different sports. And, and then also within the, you know, what you were just describing within the fitness programs, how important that really is for the long-term development of just their physical state, but then also, you know, how it ties into golf. So absolutely. Yeah. So, so then me as a coach, right, I, I currently don't have a fitness program within my group classes and my junior golf academy here. Mm -hmm. You know, how can you kind of, you know, whip me into shape and anybody else that's listening to like, you know, get something started? You know, why is it so important? So it's I think it builds camaraderie. It builds a buzz around what you're what you're making and the kids have more fun. Um, I think um, you can get more interaction between the kids uh, ver in a fitness, you know, playing sports, playing dodgeball, playing football, you know, doing sprints playing chase and tags, things like, things like that, a couple of times a week, once a week. And it all depends on how 
how rigorous the the golf part of of the camps and the academies are at that point because obviously you have you know a kid that comes out and is in these junior camps maybe once twice a week you know asking the parents to come out there for another one to two days a week may not be realistic i'm not saying it wouldn't help um right. but i i like maybe once a once a week camp and i think that would be more beneficial for kids that are not already involved in several other sports that's a good point kind of going back to the last question you know if once the kid goes down to a single sport, I think it would be beneficial to to talk to a, a professional just to kind of touch base with, hey, this is where we're at. This is his swing. This is where he wants to go. What do you recommend? And then go from there. Um, they may recommend, okay, this is time to start. You know, he's in his second speed window. Let's keep on making sure we're moving fast, even though we're not playing basketball anymore. Um so just talking to somebody that, that has a little bit more guidance, you might not necessarily have to have a, a camp within uh, a fitness part of your camp, but um, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure. I mean, that makes sense. I didn't even think about it in that in that manner of like a once a week kind of like camp, right? Because I was thinking in the manner of like, geez, do I have to have this like in every class? Do I need to add 30 minutes to the classes? Do I need to you know schedule time every day before the classes for students to come up? But then, like you're saying, is like you you could have like a probably I mean I don't know what size groups you would recommend for fitness classes of, of a young age for junior golfers, but maybe it could be once a week thing and then have them sign up for that hour and and get a bunch of them to come. Is that is that right? Yeah, yeah, I think that would be a good idea. Um, mm-hmm. Some of the kids I do right now that are individuals, um, we just do it before or after their lesson while they're already out at the golf course. And that seems to be working well. But obviously, if you have a you come to a point where you have all these kids, what are you going to do with them? So. Um, I do right. like the group aspect. It it keeps it fun, which is what we we're prioritizing um, a little bit at this age. So that's cool. That's great. Um, now you know you you're keeping it fun. At what point do you begin to then educate juniors on the importance of whether it's physical therapy, if it's you know if they have an injury, or just the importance of the fitness side of things to help them understand why it is what they're doing, or is that even necessary? Um, I I do think it's it's necessary. I wouldn't say I wouldn't like try to, you know, drill it into their head. Um, I would make sure you're educating mom and dad a little bit more when it comes to that. But at, at the same time, you know, I don't want them to come to me and look at me any differently than, than a golf coach. This is just a guy that's, you know, helping me get better and, and to have fun. Um, when it comes to a little bit more seriousness, I mean, you're, you're always educating. But I would say around around middle school is when I would definitely like, hey, this is why we do this. And I, I think that's very adaptable throughout the spectrum of their age. And that just would change based on their buy-in, how focused they are. You know, I have a seven-year-old right now who knows he wants to play for Alabama. <laughs> I'm just saying <laughs> but, no way. <laughs> <laughs> but um, and he'll tell you that. But, you know, am I going to – beat into this head you know that you know you need to be aware of this and conscious of this no he he can hardly hit still sit still for what we're doing but just to you know kind of grasp that he knows this is what we're here to do in the long run this is going to help him so obviously let's you know be attentive to what we're doing but you know as far as how there's not a lot of benefit for me laying down certain aspects at that young of an age mm-hmm. them just to grasp while they're there and then just have a good time that's great that's cool. Uh, I want to backtrack on something you touched on and kind of clarify a little bit more for listeners. You talked about the speed windows mm-hmm. and I'm curious about like why exactly at those ages they have these speed windows. I know, I, I believe that this is talked within TPI. Is that right? Yeah. And yeah. Could you explain those speed limo- windows a little bit more in detail? Because I think, you know, especially for those players who had playing in tournaments, uh, although I just had an episode last week that talked about comparison is the thief of joy it's hard sometimes not to, as a parent, to see another junior golfer the same age hit the golf ball, you know, 10, 20 yards further than your own junior golfer. So speed is one of those things that people always has always have at the back of their mind. So what exactly yeah. are these speed windows that you talked about? So speed windows, there's a saying, grow fast, train fast. So when we're growing fast, we want to be moving fast and we want to be keeping a little bit of the mobility that we're uh, potentially losing as our bones and muscles lengthen. So 
The speed windows for, for boys, it's 5 to 8 is the first speed window. And then the second speed window is 12 to 14. For girls, okay. the first window is 4 to 7. And their second window is from 10 to 12. So during those periods, we want to be moving quickly because that's most likely when they're going to be growing quickly. So as the bones and muscles elongate, we want to make sure that our movements are keeping up with that. They're able, their ability to load elastically, um, things like that. So, you know, when you look at older individuals and they want to gain speed and the first thing I do is I ask them, well, did you play sports when you were young? And if they played sports when they were young that involved them moving quickly within these windows, my ability to get them faster at an older age is much better and possible if they moved quickly within those windows versus somebody who didn't. That's fascinating. No way. Well, that's a message there, real quick. you know, just for, you know, parents listening, if you have like little, you know, toddlers yeah. or young, you know, young golfers to get them involved in a lot of different things, isn't it? Because yeah. just hearing that from you, it's like you have basically a student that you can work with and develop at a much faster rate just because of prior history within sports and movement. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So, the body's just more responsive to certain skills due to the changes in the growth velocity. So we just want to make sure we're cap capitalizing on that. That's wild. Okay. And so then could you give like, could you give an example of just a couple of like fun activities that you might do to kind of help with that within the classes? Like throwing the football in the yard, like have them run a route and sprint or playing badminton, you know, swinging really fast, hitting the bat, like hitting the badminton over the net, kicking a soccer ball left and right footed as far as you can, throwing a baseball, t-ball, swinging as hard as you can, playing tennis. So there's, there's a lot of stuff. And you could also incorporate using the other side of their body at that, that age, which is a priority. Um, because in between the speed windows, you look a little bit more of agility and develop being their ability to control their movements. So you can kind of start to tie that in there um, in between the windows, if that makes sense. So do you believe that lighter is faster? So like, you know, I was just thinking when you're thinking of badminton, right? Like the racket's so light, isn't it? And obviously yeah. the birdie, like when it hits the racket, there's no, I don't know what you would actually, the technical term would be, but there's no like, um, like strong force on the muscles, of the joints when there's the impact with the birdie, right? Yeah. So is that helpful with the development? for for moving patterns and speed absolutely and i mean you see just right now everybody's going to lighter shafts why because they're mm -hmm. swinging harder and they're hitting the ball farther so it's just the same thing is um when you're training for that it's it's just moving quick moving as quick as you can and i even with some of the kids i have the a radar thing even when we're swinging the tennis racket throwing the ball just to give them an incentive like just play a game with them like jokingly like swing it and they're like oh i bet you can't beat that you know again having fun being competitive and um having something there that gives them that external feedback of okay that's how fast i was swinging let me see if i can beat that yeah that's cool i like that yeah that, that keeps it interesting too yeah it's a good challenge so you know from your experience right um you know my premise now is not necessarily always about results and, you know, it is more about the experience and staying in the game for long term. However, I'm curious to know, like, maybe some of the, maybe you can share a story of a student that you've had, you know, when they came and they first saw you versus how they came out and kind of where they are results wise, whether it's from a physical standpoint or whether it's from actually performance on the golf course. Do you have anybody you could share with us? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a 10 year old right now that I've been working with probably for a couple months, one to two times a week. And um, we do all speed, speed stuff, followed by a little bit of strength and then just keeping it fun. And his parents have already noticed, you know, out on the golf course that he's hitting it farther. So um, that's, that's one, I mean, I'm not, I'm leaving out the numbers and everything like that, but mm -hmm. um, just, the, seeing the kid get excited because he's noticing that he's hitting it farther. That's, that's the biggest thing because who doesn't want to hit the ball farther? Right. Exactly. You know? So, and then when, <laughs> mom, when mom and yeah, same here. Um, when mom and dad notice, it's kind of like everybody just gets excited just because, you know, everybody loves to see hard work pay off. So, um, that's a 10 year old and I have a couple, um, high school and college players that from a physical standpoint, um, we've, 
I think seeing a 40 to 50 percent increase in their power on their non-dominant side. Um, and they say, you know, your ability to move quickly is is capped by your ability to decelerate that movement. So, um, which is why it's so important to make sure you, we're training the other side. Um, so, you, you know, you look at Jordan Spieth, he's right-handed, but he throws the football left-handed. Um, there's several major uh, professional athletes, um, even outside of golf, who are, you know, perform left or right-handed and do another sport-specific skill the opposite hand. So um, That's gone a long ways for them, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. So um, mixing that in with speed as well. So. That must be overlooked so much, right? Because I, I, certainly I overlook it myself when I'm thinking about, you know, anything in relation to, you know, my students and junior golfers is to train the other side, right? And, you know, sometimes it, it might seem silly, especially, you know, if, if you're a parent, you know, listening and you're thinking, well, geez, we got to get the right side developed, you know, and coordinated well, you know, they're still not hitting the ball. Let's just say, you know, the direction we want or whatever, you know, why are we working on the other side and doing all these things with the other side? But that, you know, when you say that, it just makes so much sense. And yeah, you know, it's, it definitely, it's got to be overlooked for sure. I mean, do you find it? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, and it's, it's important to make sure the parents know why you're doing this versus, you know, they, they bring their kid in, they're wanting their kid golf specific training. And here you are hitting a baseball, swinging a tennis racket as fast as you can. So just to make sure that they know the, the reasons and the whys behind what you're doing with them at that age, um, is, is another important factor outside of using the other side. Well, I think what you explained today is like, you know, a lot of the things you talked about with junior golf, it, you know, as I'm listening, it's like, as a parent, you could totally help out outside the classes, you know, whether it's just messing around the yard, these types of things. However, you know, for, I would say in, for most children of this age, you know, in that group setting, you're creating this fun environment that they're all coming to, they're all training, they're learning these new skills. You've got tools and things, and obviously the education, the background, the knowledge and the experience to really help them out. But then as a parent, you know, if let's just say you came, they came and watched one of your classes with fitness for juniors, you know, there could be one or two things they could go home and just kind of have fun and work on with their, with their own junior to kind of help keep that development and just keep that interest level coming up. And, you know, I really like how you describe everything with your fitness classes and how much that ties into at least what I believe in with junior golf and making it fun and interesting and keeping them involved. And I think yeah. it's awesome. It sounds like you do yeah. some great things. Well, I appreciate that. And you're, you're absolutely right. There's not... If you have a kid under the age of 14, you could just open your garage, look around, and you'll have most of the stuff that you could use to A, have fun in, in the yard, and B, do something athletic, moving quickly, using both sides of your body. That's going to help in the long term with their golf game. So that, that's the fun thing about it. Absolutely. I think that's so cool. Um, so, George, you know, you shared a lot of really good information. I've certainly learned a lot here in the last 30 minutes of just this recording. And there's a lot of things that when I go back and listen to this episode, I'm going to take some more notes on and think, how can I implement those things with my junior golfers? And then also my two, bo my two boys, I got two young boys. And, you know, as they start getting older and start to develop, I'm certainly going to start to implement some of these things that you talked about and definitely look to see what we got to kind of help, you know, with the physical yeah. side of things and uh, see if we got any tennis rackets and, and those kinds of things. And I think I'm going to go get some badminton rackets ASAP, by the way. I, I love that. Absolutely. <laughs> so for, for listeners, you know, if they wanted to find out more about what you're doing, what would be the best place they can follow what, what you're doing and where you're at? Right now, uh, Instagram, uh, Dr. George Tate. Um, that's probably where I'm most responsive. I do have um, a Facebook group and um, a website golf movement systems um, that's currently being redone but i'd say the most responsiveness in the current up-to-date of what i'm doing is on instagram so um but i'm very responsive on there obviously as you know personally maybe not so much on facebook messenger <laughs> but feel free to reach out to me i love talking love answering questions i do free consultations of you know what should i do next with my kid their a b or c or if you know, a lot of parents who just happen to have, you know, I end up treating parents for back pain and neck pain because they're coming, bringing their child to me for performance improvement. So um, I do consultations and kind of guidance on, on all the above. So um, I want to be a resource to everybody out there because it, 
I was a junior golfer at once. I would have loved to have somebody to reach out to, like myself, for some guidance and things like that. So um, feel free to reach out. Love to help. That's awesome. And I'll share that into the show notes as well so they can connect with you. So, George, before I let you go, I got one last question for you. What are your final words of inspiration for raising golfers? Um, I would say let let them lead um, and have, have fun with it. I wasn't pushed as a kid to do to do any sport activity. I was never allowed to quit if I didn't want to go. I always went to practice. I always went to soccer. Middle of soccer season, if, oh, I don't want to do this, you're going to finish out the season because you signed up for it. And then after that, if you don't want to play next year, you don't have to play. So um, I think letting the kid lead their passion and where they want to go is important. And then once the kid makes that decision, just pour and support as much as much as you can into them. Um, I have people that have, you know, they're, I have young clients and they have all, all these resources, everything given to them. Their parents have gone above and beyond for them. But then at the end of the day, like the dad will tell me, you know what, if you woke up tomorrow and said he doesn't want to play golf anymore, I'd be okay with that. I'd be like, all right, what are we doing next? So I think that's, that's important. And I, I think long-term, uh, I think it builds better athletes in, in any sport just to have that athlete develop the passion on their own and then the parents just supporting them along the way, doing all they can. So um, th- that'd be my word of advice. And obviously have fun um, and enjoy the process. So Couldn't agree more, man. Yeah, thank you so much again for coming on the podcast and sharing all this great information. No problem. It's so useful for the listeners that we have. And to look forward to hearing from the feedback from all the listeners about this episode. And hopefully they've got some more questions that they can reach out to you and talk to you about. So thanks again, George. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Travis. I appreciate it. What a fantastic interview with George Tate. And one of my big takeaways was how important it is to make sure our juniors are doing a variety of activities that include mobility, strength, and coordination skills. George also mentioned how important it is to train both sides of the body not just focusing on the dominant side, which, like I said in the episode, I think it's something that's commonly overlooked. It's something I know that I personally overlook. And I think it's something that we need to make sure that we're incorporating into our junior golfers, whether it's fitness, routine, or just other activities and sports. Now, like George said, get your juniors involved in a fitness program that will benefit them long-term while keeping it fun. And let's remember, like Jim Hardy from US Kids Golf said, Let's keep it fun enough, long enough, so they can't get enough. Thanks again for joining, and look forward to having you here back on the podcast next week.